So for those of you that don't know me or haven't met me, my name's Teddy. Um, I do see a couple of familiar names and faces. Hello, Tara. I'm glad to see you're back. <laughs> and um, Tara and I used to work together at, at Homes. That's my first experience in the real estate industry. For three and a half years, I was the office manager and admin for At Homes Realty Group. And I've been here with Valley MLS for about five months now. But that means when I came here, I came in with an admin perspective which is not um, something anyone else here had. No one had ever worked in that position before. And it was really seen as an asset that I came with that perspective because I think that our CEO, Josh McFall, actually put it the best when he said that you guys, uh, the assistants and the administrators, um, have been an underserved segment of our membership. And that is true. Um, we push out information uh, to the agents and the brokers, and we just kind of have this idea, I guess, that, that they're going to pass it on to you, um, but I have been in your shoes, and I know most of the time that's not how that works, um, so we actually have started an admin and assistant mailing list, and I would encourage you to sign up for that. Um, I'll have a resource sheet that I'm going to send to you all at the end that'll have that information, but if you want to jot it down, you can email Sean, that's S-E-A-N, Sean, at valleymls.com and just let him know that you would like to start getting those um, updates to your inbox. And that way you don't have to wait on your broker or your agents to share that information with you. Because as we really know, the information actually flows the other direction most of the time. And um, my push here has been to get this information into your guys' hands because so many times here I have said, man, if I had known that when I was an assistant, man, if I had known that was the rule, my agents would have been following that rule. So that, that's kind of the, the inspiration for this class. And there has been so much support here on staff. I want you guys to know that. Assistants have been top of mind. Um, the assistant policies have been uh, you know, worked on and rewritten and, and shored up. And uh, we're just trying to make the most of you all because we think you're a great resource. So thank you so much for being here. Um, the purpose of this class, like I said, is to introduce you um, to the MLS Support and Compliance Departments. And it's in an effort to help educate you so that you can help educate our agents. Um, and, and this is really about kind of putting some more of that power in your hands. And um, again, I, I think staff people, uh, support staff make the world go round. And you'll probably hear me say that more than once. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And uh, I think I've gotten a few people here um, on staff to understand that uh, as they've seen the response to this class, quite frankly. Um, so uh, as I said, I'm new here. Uh, they tell me I can't call myself the new girl anymore, but I said, until you hire somebody else, it's me. So um, I uh, have really enjoyed my switch down here and it's, it's been really great. Um, but I did learn a lot and I learned a lot that I wish I had known when I was in a position like yours. So that's what, why we're here. And um, I'm gonna talk a lot, by the way. I'm, I'm a talker and I will just talk the whole time. But if you have something, please unmute yourself, interject, ask your question. Um, I'm happy for this to be a conversation um, because you know I honestly practiced it in my living room by myself yesterday. So it will be all boring if I do it exactly the same way. Um, so, the first thing I want to touch on, I just kind of want to go over my department. I am a participant care specialist. That's my title. I'm in the MLS uh, department. This, and we are three people. You probably have heard the names Melissa and Rhonda before. Um, those are my cohorts. Uh, Melissa is my counterpart and Rhonda is actually the head of our department. And um, we're here for member support. We're here all day, nine to five, to answer phone calls, emails, any questions that you or your agents or your brokers have about listings, about MLS compliance, about, I don't know, anything really. If I don't have the answer, I will send you to the right person or do my best to find the answer for you. That is our number one priority and why we're here. But that's not what this class is about. Um, the second thing uh, that we do is, is very important and you guys can help with this. Uh, the Paragon system optimization um, basically, if you see an issue with Paragon, if you see, hey, every time I go to enter this listing, there's this weird little hiccup that happens, um, we want to know about that. Because if we don't know you're experiencing that, we, don't, we can't fix it. Um, you know, we don't use the MLS in the same way that you guys use it. And honestly, you use it in a different way than your agents use it. 
So um, again, you're going to bring a unique perspective. And I've actually been able to fix a couple of things just because a person or an, some, especially admin have brought things to me and said, hey, why is this like this? And I say, I'm not sure because I'm new and I have no idea. And so I have to go dig it up. And then when there's not a good answer to why is this like this, we fix it and make it not like that anymore. So um, that's great. I love that part of my job. And I hope I invite you all to be a part of that. Just a couple quick examples that I think are fun. Um, we're going to talk about the report it button. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to show you that in just a minute. That has been long present on residential listings. But in my first week here, someone tried to report something on a rental listing. And Rhonda very helpfully suggested they could just hit the report it button. Um, and it turns out there was not a report it button on rental listings. And so uh, that's what I said to her was, well, there isn't one, you know, new girl just kind of shrugged my shoulders and went on. Within an hour, Rhonda walked back up to me and said, there's a report it button on rentals now. And that just impressed the absolute heck out of me. I mean, to, to have a problem and to just solve it that fast for a member, um, I thought I'm in the right place. I'm gonna like it here. So um, that was one example. And then very recently uh, when we started this data share that we're doing with Birmingham, which I'm also gonna touch on that a little bit if anybody has questions about that. Um, when we started doing that, <coughs> excuse me, the, some of you may have noticed the market monitor, if you use that, kind of what people would call the hot sheet, suddenly it's double what it used to be because you're seeing all of those greater Alabama listings as well. So I had an agent call and say, I don't want to see that. Like, it's great that I can see it if I want to, but I'm not interested in that market and I don't want to have my hot sheet flooded with all of these on here. And while there is a way to search from originating system, the hot sheet was the hot sheet. It was pulling everything. And so again, within an hour, Rhonda had talked to the Paragon rep and come back to me and said, now you can specify originating system on the market monitor. You can say which one you want or both. Just like you always could with county or with type. Now you can say, I only wanna see the Valley listings or I only wanna see the greater Alabama listings. So um, again, just super cool to me that we can see a problem and fix it that fast. And th they're not always that fast and that easy. I wish they were, but um, but we try, we really do. We want, that's what we want to do is make it work better for you all. If it works better for you, it works better for us. Um, I also want to talk just a little bit about some terminology, but I think I'm going to get into that when we um, actually are looking at things. But do y'all remember when you got into this industry and people started telling you that the selling agent didn't represent the seller, the selling agent represents the buyer, and you were like confused by that? <laughs> Or maybe you work in an office where people still refer to the Alta Settlement Statement as the HUD, even though you've never seen a statement called the HUD in your life. Um, we kind of have a problem in our industry, I think, of calling things different things. And uh, I call it the jargon issue. And so we're going to touch base on that a little bit. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead right now and say that um, you'll hear Paragon. Paragon is the software system that houses the MLS uh, for us. Paragon is owned by Black Knight. So if you see Black Knight, you can kind of almost interchangeably associate that with Paragon. And then we have Clarity. Clarity is actually who hosts our dashboard, which we'll get to in just a minute. And um, th so those are kind of the three words you might hear thrown around, Clarity, Paragon, and um, Black Knight. But the actual products that we use are the Clarity dashboard, and then we use the Paragon system. The, the page you land on would be your Paragon homepage. So we're just going to kind of I'm going to keep reiterating that because, again, when I get a member on the phone and they want to keep calling their Paragon homepage their dashboard, we get very confused about what we're looking at, you know, so um, always good to know what everyone's talking about. And just so you know, any of you that are uh, maybe new or not as comfortable with Paragon, we do have trainings available that you can take advantage of. Um, most of those, uh, I think we have two scheduled, one for dot loop and one for listing input. One is this Friday and one is next Friday. And then kind of a break until January, Mike will start teaching those again, like Paragon Basics, MLS Tips and Tricks. Um, there are great classes, they're free, and you are absolutely um, entitled to take advantage of those. So keep an eye out. That's another push that we've made is to make those classes visible to you guys, because nobody here even knew that you guys couldn't see the class schedule. And I said, how are they supposed to tell their agents what training is available if they don't know what training is available? So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing that more and more. Any blind spots that you guys know about, make yourself a note, send me an email. I don't know all the blind spots, but we, we want to try to eliminate as many as possible. 
All right, so moving on, um, we're gonna talk about data compliance. Um, that is actually the biggest part of, of this class. We're gonna talk about um, how to keep listings in compliance, what those courtesy notices look like and things like that. So at this point, I'm gonna start screen sharing with you guys. And um, I am a little clunky at this. So uh, forgive me just one second while I click through the things. Uh, let's see, share screen. And I want you to see this one. There we go. All right, can everyone see the big blue line across the top? Are we all looking at the same thing? I see somebody nodding, okay. So this is the Clarity dashboard. This is what I was just referring to. Most of you hopefully are signing in like this um, and landing on this page. Your buttons might look a little different than mine, but essentially the important one is right here. You have your Paragon MLS button. And we click that to get into Paragon, uh, which then lands us on uh, what I referred to as the Paragon homepage. And as you can see, it's just as slow for me as it is for you sometimes. Um, this is your Paragon homepage. Yours is gonna look different than mine because we all have our own preferences and setups. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, all of these uh, little widgets here are actually, let me minimize this, how do I do that? There we go. All of these are actually movable. Um, I can put the market monitor down here if I want and have my contact activity up there, but that actually is not meaningful to me. Um, I can move Paragon News down if I don't care uh, to see that at the top, so because I want my quick search at the top. Um, all of that is very customizable. Um, and I just kind of wanted to point that out to you guys. Oh, I apparently don't know how to put it down though. Um, right here in the middle is an important section, and this is where we're going to start. So the rules. Um, if you guys know the rules, it's a lot easier to follow the rules. Um, so I'm going to show you where to find them. Um, it's important to know that these rules do change. And again, I'm going to reiterate the importance of um, having your, your emails set up so that you can get our updates because when they change, that's one of the ways we announce the change. We'll put it out in the weekly update. Um, we will try to put it in one of those pop-ups that comes up when you log into Paragon, one of those great things that most people don't read. They're just like, get out of my way, I'm busy. Um, we do try to, to as, and in as many ways as we can, get the information out. You guys are gonna be um, really instrumental in helping us do that. And I um, am really excited to see exactly how much that's gonna change. How, how fewer people I'm gonna get calling saying, well, I didn't know that because if you guys know, I know that they're gonna know. So um, I'm excited about that change. So please get signed up for those, um, <coughs> excuse me, for those updates. Um, and like I said, I do kind of wanna briefly mention this. The rules do change. And for those of you that don't know, I am not the one who, uh, excuse me, some more people have come in. Here we go, we're admitting them now. I'm not the one who makes the rules. There's nobody here on staff that makes the rules. These rules are made by committees of, of agents and those changes that they propose are passed up to the board members who are also agents and the agents vote and decide on the rules. Um, HAR, the Huntsville Area Association of Realtors is a nonprofit entity comprised of those agents. Valley MLS is a for-profit company that they own. So the agents actually pay us to enforce their rules. We are, um, their employees, if you will. So a lot of times you get an angry agent who's upset about a rule and I have to remind them, it is not my rule, I promise. Like all I can do is enforce it. That's what I'm here to do. So just wanted to throw that out there. So where are the rules? Um, the first place that you can find them is right here on your Paragon homepage. If you scroll down through the middle, which some of you may have never done. You, I mean, you're probably just in here to do your thing and you have never even noticed that you can scroll down right here. Um, but you can, and there's a lot of great information. You can see there's, um, you know, some of the stuff we've tried to get out, the ad campaign, um, activity, the uh, compliance class. Hey, look, that was a big one. We were pushing this class because it's brand new. In case you guys didn't know that, you're the second class. Uh, my first class had about seven, and we had about 70 signed up, and that looks like we've got about 45 in here. So that's pretty good, um, especially for busy admin folks. Um, so, if you keep scrolling, you get your market stats, all that's great. You've got these wonderful resources. Oh, look, Huntsville City Schools, Madison City Schools, Madison County Schools, we've got links for you right there. 
all kinds of wonderful stuff. But right here in these big blue boxes, this is where we're going. MLS rules and regulations. We've got our um, HAR bylaws. We also have the policies of Valley MLS and then the penalty policy. The two that are gonna be most important are the rules and then the penalty policy if you get to that point. So let's open the rules and take a quick look at those. <coughs> Excuse me. When you open it, you can see that it's a nearly 60 page document. Um, you're not gonna sit down and read it um, unless you're looking for some bedtime reading. Uh, and how do you find the rule that you want? So I wanna show you very quickly as a function of your browser, when you're in this page, if you hit control F, you can see that we have a search box that pops up here. And I'm looking for information about square footage. So I'm gonna type in the word square and it tells me that there are six. I'm looking at the first highlighted right here. That's one of six you can notice here. And these little arrows will kind of lead me through each one. And when I get to the third one, oh boom, I found what I was looking for. These are the four valid sources of square feet. So that's how I'm gonna know, am I allowed to use tax records as the square footage information? Am I allowed to use a previous listing? The answer is no, and here's how you know that, because there are four valid sources of square footage and one of those is not listed. And as a matter of fact, if you go down a little further, you can even see that we've uh, claim, uh, plainly stated tax records are not a valid source. A lot of times an agent will mark appraiser measured and then they will call that a tax appraisal. And unfortunately, the rule is um, really just trying hard to, um, you know, keep the data as accurate as we can. And um, that's the whole point of this rule. Um, some of you have probably seen those compliance notices come through. Uh, we'll talk about those in just a second, but we do audit um, for source of square foot. If you're ever looking for the rule, there it is. Any other rule we were looking for, um, let's think um, like you got a notice and you don't understand motivated seller. Why did we get in trouble for putting motivated seller? To me, I'll be honest, this is one of the strangest rules uh, because it specifically lists some terms you cannot use. And look, the only time the word motivated appears in our rules is, is in this one spot where it says terms like terms to be arranged at full price or motivated seller are not allowed to appear. Um, basically, those are terms that imply uh, that the full terms of the sale aren't being stated. Um, so I guess that's, you know, again, that's kind of almost a strange rule to me, but I didn't make the rule. I'm just following the rule and it's right there. So that's where you find the rules. Um, let's go back and look at the penalty policy as well. I'm just going to click back over to Paragon and I'm clicking on the penalty policy. Um, I'm going to throw out there for now that this actually might change. Uh, we have some proposed changes that the board has opted not to look at next year. So for now, this is the policy that we have. Um, there are some wording, you know, some words here about how we um, process violations. But the thing that's probably going to be most interesting to you is the chart of the fines and how the flow of that works. You'll see some of them are escalating. Um, for instance, um, a duplicate, putting in a duplicate listing. Um, the first offense, 250, second, 500, and the third is 1,000. That's, that's a pretty decent fine right there. Uh, so some of them do escalate, some of them don't, some of them are really minuscule, some of them are quite large. And as you get down to the bottom, you'll find some really large fines. And we're gonna talk about those uh, here in just a minute actually, but you'll see down here that um, we have a, a couple of fines that are $1,000 and actually one that's $2,000. Um, so there are some really big deals uh, in here that we don't wanna, don't wanna miss. But <clears throat> just kind of going back to where you find the rules, you can look here um, in this document in the same way. You can control F and you can search this document or you can go back to those um, rules and regulations and do that same thing. And there are a few other places too. So try to follow me. Uh, if you've heard of RESPA, I'll be completely honest. I'm not an agent. I don't know what RESPA stands for. I don't know um, exactly what the decision was or what it was about. But I know that our lawyers here at Valley MLS have told us that one of the things that RESPA means is that you cannot in your listing stipulate who the closing will happen with. You can't say closing to take place at XYZ title company. Um, you may not do that in a listing. That is a RESPA violation. And while we do not have a rule specifically in Valley MLS rules against it, that rule supersedes our rules. So I hope that makes sense. Um, we aren't going to let you break a rule 
that supersedes ours. So uh, we're still going to send you a notice about that. You'll also find on the coming soon addendum and on the exclusive right to sell and also on the listing change notice, there are some rules listed there that are specific to those documents. It isn't that they aren't listed elsewhere, but when you're using that document, it's really handy that they're right there for you to look at. So it's important to read all the words um, and not just get in the habit of filling in blanks, um, especially because forms do get updated. This is another thing I need your help with. So please, please, please help me. If you are working for a company that creates templated loops, if you have a broker dashboard where they are pulling their documents from, please make sure that when we update our documents, you are updating your documents. Because a lot of times I'm seeing old versions of forms and they're telling me, well, that's what I got from my office. Um, and then I'll have to instruct them on how to go find the most up-to-date version. Again, we announce that uh, when we update forms. Um, a few to look for if you have not recently updated those things. The listing change notice has been updated um, in just the past few months. The finance sales contract has been updated. Most of the brokers didn't miss that one. Most brokers noticed the finance sales contract got changed, but listing change notice also got changed. So look for that. It should say updated, I believe August, 2020 at the bottom on that listing change notice. So make sure you're using the correct one. And that one's important because of our new temporarily off market, which we're gonna to get to in just a second. So those are kind of where we find the rules. Um, now what happens when you break one? So you guys are gonna get a little behind the scenes look here into my uh, listing data checker software, which is what I use, uh, what we use here to try to check these listings for compliance. So I'm gonna click over here and here's your very exciting behind the scenes look. This is where I live about half my life is in this uh, wonderful software. When um, the, there are a couple ways that a listing might get reported. A lot of them are automated. A, a lot of things come in in this bucket right here that says new. And that is going to be ones that the system has caught itself. Um, we have a few rules like past projected closing date that are very common. And the system is really good at catching those when it's working correctly. We actually had a hiccup. If anybody is in here that experienced a hiccup, um, I am aware that in November it was not working correctly. But uh, the way it's supposed to work is that the day after you are past that projected closing date, the system will send a notice that says, here's your first notice that you've gone past your projected closing date. And uh, then it will, three days later, because you have a three-day grace period, if you have not yet updated it, you will get the fine notice. And I have never touched that or looked at it. That's completely automated. Um, another way that they can get reported is through that report it button, which actually let's hop right back over to Paragon because I forgot to show you that. And I'm just going to pick on somebody here. Random listing from the new list. That was the market monitor I was referring to, by the way, and all those settings I was talking about, there's a little gear right there by that word. If you want to go back and I'll show you my things in the way. There's a little gear right here and you can change your settings to only look for certain classes, types in certain counties, or here's that originating system. You can also tell it how many, how many days back do you want to go? Mine's set to only go one day back, but you can go up to seven. So just, just some stuff for you to know. If you don't utilize this, you may find this information useful for an agent later who is trying to figure out how to use that and, and doesn't know what it's for. So anyway, I opened that up when I clicked on the new, th this is what I get. Literally everything that was a new listing in the past day, some of them are gonna be from Birmingham, but I'm gonna click on one that's from us because I recognize the MLS number. And you'll see these little buttons here beside the picture. They're all meaningful, but the only one that I want you to worry about at the moment is the one with the little house with the check mark. That is called the report it button. Has anybody ever used the report it button before? I see some of you saying yes. When you click the report it button, um, it's just gonna give you uh, this little text box here where you can tell me what you think is wrong with this listing. And when I say me, I mean that, I mean, right now, at least the way we're working, um, I am primarily running the compliance software. So if you put a note, you can say, hi, Teddy, and I'm gonna see it because it's gonna come to me. Um, but what it does when you do that, it gets put in this little bucket here called the report it new. And this is gonna be all the um, agent reported violations that I have yet to address. So uh, most of those hopefully are from last night. And um, 
then also staff will, will report uh, things they see as well. Um, when we're looking at a note at, at a listing for another reason, if we see a violation, we will also obviously pursue that. So those are the three ways that you kind of um, come across a violation, if you will. Um, but there are also three levels of violations. So let's kind of go through those. The first is called the courtesy notice. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Uh, the courtesy notice is the most common thing that gets sent out. I would say this is not necessarily a violation. Um, it even says at the top that it contains a potential violation. My dog is barking and I apologize. Uh, <laughs> but most agents see this and, and they just see violation and they think, what did I do wrong? Uh, but a lot of times they're, what they're not doing is scrolling down. And so I wanna show you down here in this box is gonna be the information that's specific to this listing. There is the MLS number, the address, all that stuff is gonna be automated. And then there's gonna be some red text at the bottom when I send these out typically, um, maybe not always, but if I have added a note, for instance, telling you what this notice is about, it's gonna be right here in this area, usually in red, if I remember to make it red. And um, because-, oh, because Excuse the me, I, I don't believe I'm seeing what you're- Are you guys not seeing the template? No. Oh, no. okay. I I'm thought sorry. when I opened it, all right, let's try this again. New share. Thank you for speaking up. How do I, well- If you have a second screen open, chances are it's on your second screen and you just need to slide it over to the first screen. No, it's right here in my, I thought when it popped up in the front of the window, y'all would be able to see it. Can you see it now? Did that work? It should say- Yes, notice. we see it now. Okay. Yeah, it just popped up here and I thought we would all be able to see it together. I bet nobody told me last time I did this class that they couldn't see what I was showing them. So um, thank you for saying that. So again, down here, if you'll see what it looks like at the top and most of the agents are just seeing this and they're not scrolling down to the box. Here is where you'll find that red text that I've added that describes what this notice is about. A courtesy notice is most typically gonna be an audit for the source of square footage. We audit every 10th listing that is marked as appraiser measured or appraisal for the source of square footage. Every 10th one will get a list, will get a courtesy notice asking for that appraisal measurement. It is not only the appraiser measured that get that get audited. I get that back a lot lately from agents when I say, you know, here's your audit for your source of square footage. They reply back with, this is realtor measured. Yes, it is. And I need those measurements. Um, so there, there is some confusion there too. They are required to provide that source of square footage when asked regardless of what it is. It's just that we have a rule saying we will audit every 10th one. Again, we didn't make that rule. The agents did. And so we have to follow it. So that's what um, a courtesy notice will often be for. Um, you might also get one for, um, you know, just a, hey, can you check and make sure this information is right kind of a thing. And if it is right, you're always welcome to just reply back to that notice and say, yep, verified, it's all correct. Um, and so that's, that's a courtesy notice. So I'm going to close this one. I'm going to open another one. And I probably will have to share that one with you too. Uh, moving up the chain, um, we're actually going to skip over correctable violations for a second because they take a little longer to explain and we're going to talk about immediate fines. So I'm going to open up an immediate fine violation and show you what that looks like. And let's see if I can share that with you. Are you seeing immediate fine notice? Awesome. Yes. Great. So you'll see that this says that it is not an invoice because the notice comes from my software and the invoice is going to come from the accounting department. So this is where the human element comes in. Uh, the notice might be um, automated in some ways, but the fines themselves actually have a human element. So getting the fine notice is not the same as actually being fined, but nine times out of 10, if you get the notice, especially an immediate fine notice, um, you are going to later receive an invoice for that. So again, we scroll down and we can see where that information would be. A lot of times um, agents get confused because they'll fix the issue. And then uh, three weeks later when they get an invoice, they're like, but I fixed it. An immediate fine notice must be corrected, but there is no grace period. So that means you already got fined. <laughs> you, you do have to fix it, but you already received a fine for it. And examples of those 
uh, would be promo information in the public remarks. In case you didn't know, an agent is not allowed to say, call Jane Doe at 256-538-7921. Can't do that in your public remarks. There's a spot for that and it's not there. I mean, imagine being a buyer's agent. You don't wanna send a listing to your buyer that tells that person to call another agent. So we don't want that information there. Um, and once you've put it there and it's been syndicated out, we can never call that back. You know, we can change it. We can change what's syndicated out, but you've already pushed it out into the interwebs with, you know, information that wasn't supposed to be there. So that is why that fine is immediate. Um, also signage in your photos. Um, if you have photos on a listing and you can see a visible uh, broker sign in them, please don't use them because that's an immediate fine if it's caught. Those are harder to catch. I'll admit my system will catch the promo information by itself. Photos have to be seen with human eyes. So a lot of those do slide by, but it still is against the rules. And if it's caught is an immediate fine. Um, the motivated seller rule that I mentioned earlier is another surprising fine for people and it is immediate. Um, a lot of times a seller will ask an agent, I want you to tell everybody that I'm a motivated seller. I want them to know that I really wanna sell this house but you just can't use those words. So that's always unfortunate when a seller says, I want you to do it and then the agent does it and gets a fine. So if you guys know they can't use it, hopefully fewer of them will use it. Um, and if you're curious about those fines, again, I've shown you the penalty policy and I've shown um, where you can find those. So I'm gonna close the fine notice now and I'm gonna open, um, oh, I stopped screen sharing. That's not what I meant. All right, we'll try this again. Doo -doo -doo. I'm going to share this one and then I'm going to open the um, first notice is what this is called. Nope, I put edit. Preview, there we go. And now share that with you. So here we have the what's called the first notice. Um, a lot of your agents are getting this again automated because our very our, our most common um, violation by far is past projected closing date, and the system is going to automatically trigger this notice um, the day that they go past that. And if you scroll down a little bit, again we have the same section. Probably there won't be any red text from me here because I didn't look at this one but it's gonna tell you what listing it is. It's gonna very clearly say you've gone past your projected closing date. Please update that information or mark your listing as sold if it has sold. I'll be honest, most agents completely ignore this notice. Um, the notice that they will usually act, and again, I have done the wrong thing here and closed the screen. Um, I'm not used to this, okay. The notice that they'll get next after that three-day grace period is the fine notice. Uh, the fine notice is the one most of them will pay attention to because uh, they see that word fine and they're like, oh, you've got my attention. So it doesn't really look any different than the rest of them. As you can see, we're looking at the fine notice now, except it does say a fine will be placed on your account for non-compliance. This is not an invoice. It doesn't say that here, but I want you guys to know that. This is not an invoice. A fine will be placed on your account. So let's say they get the fine notice and they change that past projected closing date right then because they didn't pay attention to the first one, but they see this one. When I go in there and I look at what's called the correctable violations, which I'll show you in just a second, um, I will go through these one by one. And if they have corrected it, then I will um, take that fine off. If they've corrected it immediately after receiving the fine notice, basically what I will do is not take that fine and put it in the spreadsheet for the accounting department. I'll just say, okay, you fixed it. Because guys, I want you to know this. We don't want to fine anyone. I think that agents have this idea that we have this big budget line and we're trying to get to a certain amount of fines or something like that. Um, but the fines are specifically there just to have a, re a, a reason to make agents wanna correct things. And all we really care about is keeping the data accurate and current and correct so and complete. So that's what this is all about. Um, let's switch back over to the screen. Okay. And um, you'll see here that I have a notifications. These are, this is my notified bucket 
Right now I have 79 of them and most of them are correctable notifieds. And I will go through each one of those and make sure that they have been corrected. And if they've been corrected, great. Um, and then the courtesy only notifies here. Again, I have to go through those and make sure I'm getting back the documentation that I've requested. And if I haven't gotten it, I want you guys to hear me. This is a listing audit. I will reply to it one time and say, please respond to the listing audit. And if they don't, I have to find them $250 for failure to respond to an audit. So I'm trying real hard not to do that. I really, really don't want to, um, but I have had to do that unfortunately a few times. So um, don't make me do that. Um, so uh, let's talk about correctable violations for just a minute before we move on. Uh, I wanted to just kind of throw out a few examples. We talked about past projected closing date. That's very, very common. Owner name, owner name. We have a rule that says every listing in the MLS must have the full name of the owner listed. A full name is not an initial. Even though my system is not smart enough to know that you cannot have a one letter name, although I will admit in one time in my 40 years, I have met somebody with a one letter last name. It's a very, very uncommon. So uh, the system just knows, oh, they entered something great, uh, but it's still a violation. And I can't catch it by automated means. I'm only catching it when I see it. So I'm catching as many as I can, but invariably I will have an agent come back and say, well, I see that all the time. And I say, when you see it, please hit the report it button so that I can get it fixed because it's not supposed to be that way. Owner name, that's a big one. Let's see, oh, status, uh, make sure that if your agents are putting in listings as active, that they are ready to be shown. You may not put in a listing on a Wednesday and say showings to begin on Saturday. You may not do that. If the listing goes in on Wednesday, it better be available to be shown. That doesn't mean it has to be available every moment, but you can't put a listing in for days before it is available to be shown. Um, we have a, a status for that, it's called coming soon. So um, again, that's another correctable violation most of the time, unless it's gone too far down the road, in which case we're gonna end up having to find somebody, you know, for having it up for a week before they let anybody see it. And we don't wanna do that. I have a um, question about that. Yes, throw it out there. Um, when you're doing new construction, for example, and you have proposed construction and under construction, but you have a model, can you list those as active or do you have to list those once they're <laughs> proposed or under construction as coming soon? Currently, the rules um, allow you to list a model as active, but I'll be honest, um, I have a, a work group hopefully happening in the beginning of next year to address this issue because I think what we need is a special classification for model homes so that we don't have um, a bunch of consumers getting upset that this is not an active listing that they can live in. Um, we're looking at maybe like a, a, um, a status called active model or something like that. Um, so for now, you can go with active because that's the best we have. But we do, and I think you probably are, uh, we do ask that you make it as obvious as you can in your remarks that this is a model home and um, that's the best we can do for now. But that's a great question. Thank you. <clears throat> and again, that issue has come up and that's exactly why we're, we have several issues with new construction because our rules are really designed for, for existing residential listings new construction listings are not required to be entered into the MLS. Um, but if you want them in there, and a lot of you do, um, they do have to follow the same rules. So we're trying to figure out ways to make those rules more specific and meaningful um, for the new constructions. So we're gonna, hopefully next year, uh, you guys are gonna be top of mind for that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna get a little drink here. I'm, I'm wearing my voice out. <clears throat> I promise it's Coke. Um, you never know in a koozie, do you? So um, one other uh, just quick mention of a, of a correctable violation, because this is a big one, and then we're going to move on to fines. Um, we do have a rule, in case you don't know this, that stipulate what rooms number one, two, and three are supposed to be. And um, I'm just going to hop over. I think it'd be actually great for us to uh, maybe look at the rules together. Are we? Did I hop over to the rules for everybody now? Are we seeing um, text, just lots of text? <laughs> I'm gonna go control F. Oop, nope, that's not right. I already had it up here. 
I want to look at entering rooms and I hate the way this is listed. I'll be honest with you. I think it's really difficult to find it um, when it's called that, but that is what it's called, entering rooms. So here we are, the details on entering rooms. Please tell me if you're not seeing this with me. Um, when you enter a listing into Paragon, the first three rooms are auto selected for you. If you have done listing input, you know this. Room number one will, will auto populate to the living room. It will also let you choose great room or family room if you'd rather call it that. Room two is the kitchen and room three is the master bedroom. Unfortunately, Paragon ran into some kind of snag with forcing those rooms to stay there. So you can actually change kitchen and master bedroom to other rooms. And when I see it, I will flag it as a violation because room two has to be the kitchen and room three has to be the master bedroom. Agents hate this. Some of you already know they hate this because they don't like the way the rooms show up on the report. Nothing we can do about it. Um, these three have to be this way. You can put the other rooms anywhere you want, but these three have to be here. Here's the part that's really tripping people up though. For rooms four to 18, you can select any room from the list and then the dimensions and level and a minimum of one description term of the room is required for rooms one and three and the bedrooms. So I bet a few of you have had this issue where there was a listing that was pending and you tried to change something about it or mark it as sold or any way update that listing and you got an error about your bedroom count. And that is because um, up until about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago, Paragon would allow the listing to be saved with no bedrooms. And I finally was like, hey guys, why do we do that when they are supposed to enter the bedrooms? And so sure enough, we were able to change it. You're welcome. So that uh, they actually have to enter the same number of bedrooms that the listing says it has. So the master bedroom will count as one, and then you have to enter the additional bedrooms. Now, why are there no little red R's, Teddy? If it's required, there are no other little red R's. I don't know what's happening. Well, that's because you can put the bedroom anywhere you want in rooms four through 18. I'm not gonna put the red R beside the, the spot because you can put it anywhere. But as soon as you tell the system room, you know, room 12 is a bedroom, then the little red R's will appear for dimensions and level. And even though this says one descriptive term, it's actually dimensions and level we're really looking for. So those will be required. If you try to save it without that information, the error will appear across the line that says number of bedrooms. And you'll wonder, why am I getting an error on that? It is a three bedroom house. Well, you haven't listed three bedrooms yet. That's the problem. So that was a lot of explanation because I'm hearing this a lot from agents. It's tripping people up. They think it's a new rule. It's not a new rule. It's been a rule for a long time. It's just that the system used to let you save it without that information. And we're trying our best to get it to where the system will limit you as much as possible um, so that you aren't accidentally causing a violation. So that I wanted to mention on the entering rooms. I also do wanna talk about fines again. So I'm gonna switch back over to the penalty policy. Um, <clears throat> again, I wanna mention this might change. So keep, keep your eyes open for that. But until it's changed to approve, you know, the changes are approved by the board, this is what we have and this is what we're working with. Number one, I want you to notice that, or I want you to know that every member of our MLS is entitled to one waiver on a violation of penalty up to $100. It's a, it's a one-time fee waiver um, that we, you know, everybody makes a mistake kind of a thing. And uh, we do try to offer that, but just so you guys know, you can let your agents know if they've never used it before, they actually can kind of get out of jail free one time um, up to $100 with their waiver. So that is something we offer. Um, we did talk a little bit about the difference between a fine notice and an invoice. Again, I think I explained that the notice will then have, that information has to get transferred physically by me into a spreadsheet for our accounting department. And the way he works internally, there's not always a predictable um, time frame. So I try to warn people that the invoice will come in the coming weeks, um, usually two to four. Um, but again, it just depends on his workload and how everything kind of shakes out in the sheet. He also rearranges that sheet every once in a while because he tries to keep people's names together. You know, you don't want to get three different invoices. You know, you want to get one invoice with all your fines on it. But doing that also means that the dates get a little out of order sometimes. So um, some people do wait a little while and they get confused. Why am I getting an invoice? 
I fixed that a month ago, you know, kind of stuff. So just wanted to let you know that so you can help calm them down when that happens. Um, and Alan also, by the way, Alan is our accountant and he has very helpfully um, put my phone number and email on all of those notices so that people that are upset will call me and not him, which I thought was just really lovely of him to do. <laughs> um, all right, I wanna talk about the big fines. And this is what I kind of brought you down to the bottom of this sheet for, because these, the, these are the really, really big ones, guys. So first of all, let's talk about coming soon. I did mention the coming soon addendum um, had been updated recently. I believe it was in February of this year. Um, I definitely know it was updated in 2020. So you wanna make sure you're using the newest version of the coming soon addendum um, because it does have the rules listed on there. And it tells you um, for sure, do not show this property. Don't show this property. And you can see here in the penalty policy that we're looking at, if you were to violate that and you show the property while in the coming soon status, it's a $1,000 fine. It's a big one, it's a big fine. Um, there are also other parts of that policy that people find odd, like you are supposed to attach the coming soon addendum to the listing itself. Um, you do that when you're in the maintenance screen on the left-hand side, there will be a choice to add or edit a document. You can click that, add this, the coming soon addendum as a PDF, tell us it's a coming soon addendum as a file type, and then nobody will be able to see it, except for us, the listing agent, and people with you know broker load permission, or not broker load, but broker permissions at your office. I'm saying that because basically you'll be able to see it because most of you are signing in either as an agent or the broker, um, or not signing in, but assuming their identity. So that's a big one. Um, Sorry, could you tell me, I missed, uh, I had a, a, a shiny moment. Um, when we enter it as a document, how do we uh, classify it? So uh, you'll just upload the document. You, right. You have to name the document and then it asks you to choose a file type. And one of the file types you can choose is coming soon addendum. Oh, okay. But does, um, as far as uh, whether we make it public or not, that's what I was thinking that you were talking about. Um, it will default to not being public. There is a okay. little box there you can check if for some reason you would like everyone to see it, but um, no. it will okay. default to not being public. Okay, Please. thanks. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, but again, it says at the bottom of that form to attach it, and a lot of people miss that. They either don't know we're supposed to have it or they email it to us because that's the old way that we did it. But you can imagine with the number of coming soon we have coming on the market, that gets to be a little overwhelming, especially with three people in the department and they're just mailing it to whoever. Um, and then I get a coming soon violation and I don't know that Melissa has that in her inbox, you know? So um, we are now saying it's best to just put it on the listing and that way everybody who needs to see it will be able to see it. Um, the rule also, I'm just gonna jump ahead of myself on my notes here because there's a rule about coming about um, temporarily off market that mirrors that. Um, if you are going to put a listing temporarily off market, you better know the rules of that status because it is not just paused. Even though it replaced paused, they changed the rules about it very recently. One thing is you must attach the listing change notice to the listing itself in the same way that we just discussed on a coming soon. Um, you may not mark it a temporarily off market. You must pull your sign. If you had a sign in the yard and they need to go TOM, you've got to pull the sign. You cannot market the property at all. You obviously cannot show it. And um, it's a, it is a 30 day limit on both of these statuses. Coming soon is a 30 day limit and will expire at the end of 30 days unless you make it active. Um, temporarily off market is a 30 day limit and it will become active at the end of 30 days, unless you cancel it. And I'll be um, just real quick, let you know here, you can't just cancel it. You will literally have to make it active and then cancel it because that's the only thing that a temporarily off market can do is go back on the market. So um, just know that it's a 30 day limit on that status and you may not re-enter it. If your listing goes back active because you've hit your 30 day limit and then you take it back into temporarily off market status, you were in violation of that policy. So I'm, I'm driving that home because I need you guys to look at the very last line here. Temporarily off-market policy, violation of the temporary off-market status, $1,000. I get one fine. If we look at coming soon, 
I have a couple different fines. I have the fine for um, advertising or, or otherwise violating the policy on coming soon is quite a lot smaller than the violation for showing the property. For temporarily off market, I have one fine, $1,000. We have asked the compliance committee to address that. They have, the board has not approved their changes. So for right now, that's all we've got. And we do not want to charge anybody $1,000 for failure to attach a document. So here's what's happening. I set up a rule in my listing data checker software so that every time a, a, a listing gets marked as temporarily off market, I, I'm, get, I'm getting flagged on that so that I can send them a courtesy notice that says, here are the rules, just so you know. And some of them will reply back because they don't know, they, did I do something wrong or whatever? No, you didn't. You're allowed to use this status, but you will have no excuse for not knowing what the rules are because I sent you an email that told you what the rules are. And if you violate the status, I'm gonna feel just a little bit less bad about charging you $1,000 for it because I've tried real, real hard not to. So um, that's what that's about. I really want you guys to familiarize yourself with those rules. And anytime you see temporarily off market in your office, I want you to be as nervous as it makes me. Um, Can I ask you a quick question about that? Absolutely. Okay, because we recently got that ding. I'll just own it. Um, and once I attached my listing change notice to my my agent's listing, do I need to do anything else to say, hey, Teddy, heads up, we fixed it, we're super sorry? No, because what I want you to understand is I didn't even look at your listing. I didn't okay. know it wasn't there. You actually have three days to attach it. Okay. Um, I am sending you that courtesy specifically as a courtesy. Just here's the rules, period. Because I'm not going in and looking at temporarily off market right now. I will eventually start auditing those. But until I get this policy where I feel like it should be, I just, I really don't want to, I'm not going to look for a reason to charge somebody so much. Um, so we're just kind of putting it out there. And then if something gets reported or for another reason, we find that it hasn't followed the rules, there's going to be an, you know, a notification trail that you can't claim you didn't know because we told you specifically. Does that make sense? That does. And it leads me to another question, which is as a licensed assistant, am I allowed to get CC'd on these different notices and listing audits that are going to my agents? Yes. I'm glad that you mentioned that because one of the things that I had actually meant to say earlier is about where these notices go. And I'm glad that you brought that up. So the notices go to three places automatically. They go to the listing agent. They're gonna go to whatever email address we have on file for the office, which I'll be honest, I am shocked at the number of offices that do not have an email address on file because we don't require that. So we have require a phone number, but not an email. So. Uh, if we do have an office email, it will go to that one as well. If we, and then the, the third place that will always go is whatever email we have on file for the broker. So if the broker is the listing agent and also has their email as the office email, one email gets sent because it's going to the same three places. Um, I have an instance right now where a broker is trying to use a shared email address as her broker email and gets upset when, when, um, when everybody sees those notices. But we're working on fixing that um, and trying to figure out the best way to, to do what we can because I can't change that. If, if that is the broker email that's being used, those notices are gonna go there every time. So those are the three places and I can't take those away, but I can add. I can add additional people to get those notices. So what you would just need to do is send me an email uh, let me know that you would like to start getting notices for your office or for your agents or, you know, whatever, you know, pocket that needs to go in. And um, I can get your email address or even multiple email addresses added um, for those notices. Because, yes, I know, again, you guys getting them is probably even more meaningful uh, sometimes. And you don't have to even be licensed to do that. Any of you um, are able to get those for your people if you want them. So you can just send me an email about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. See what else? <coughs> excuse me. Oh, the one thing I wanted to mention about coming soon addendums, or excuse me, coming soon listings that I did not. 30 day limit and it will expire at the end. That means that when you go to take it active, please look at the expiration date before you save it because the system almost inevitably has changed your expiration date to be 30 days from when you listed it. So you will make it active and the next day come back and your listing is expired. Why did that happen? 
because you did not update your expiration date. So please note that. Um, just if you see that in the future, whenever you're working with coming soon's, just try to bear in mind that expiration date might have changed. Um, a couple of the other things that are big fines I'll just touch on briefly. Um, sharing your login credentials is a huge fine. Um, we, don't want, we don't want you to do that. Um, there's also a big fine uh, for those of you that are licensed assistants. Uh, if you were to happen to list or show property um, while the Alabama state would allow that, MLS rules do not because of the way you are, um, what's the word I want to say, kind of the way you are allowed in with kind of a reduced fee, even though you have a license. We don't want to allow you to do everything a licensed agent can do or why are you paying less than an agent would pay kind of is, is kind of where that comes from. So there is actually a large penalty for acting as an agent um, when you are in fact just a licensed assistant. Teddy. Yes. Can I interject real quick? I think there's a misunderstanding here. Someone had asked for your email address and now you've got a list of people that want to be added to that list. Uh, is it in chat? I'm not seeing chat. Yes, it's chat. in chat. Got you. I can give you my email address, sure. Um, let me put it in chat. Let me just, that'll probably be the easiest thing if I can get this back open. My issue here is when I'm sharing my screen, I don't know where all of my functions go. I mean, I see them at the top, but I don't see chat. Here's chat. Okay. All right. I'm going to give you my address. So all of the, uh, if you're giving me addresses um, to add you to things, you'll want to send those to Sean. Um, Sean is our communications director, and this is his email. I'm going to put it here for you, Sean at valleymls.com. Um, he is the one in charge of all of that. Um, so you can just send him a quick email and just say, add me to the admin list, please. And he will know what that means. My email, I, uh, I go by Teddy, but my actual email is my full name. And this would be to be added to the non-compliance emails? Yes. So for me, if you want to be added to, non to the compliance email, send me an email um, directly because I'll need you to tell me whose compliance emails you want to be added to, whether it's the whole firm or just one agent. Um, and, and I'll, sounds like a few of you are going to want that. So it may take me a, a little while to get to them, but I will get back to you and reply to your email when I have done that. Let me look and see. Uh, somebody asked about an admin email list. You may have come in a little late. Yes, we do that. We are starting that. Um, I think it was shocking to some people when I pointed out that you guys don't get to see any of this stuff. I was like, hello, <laughs> how do you think they're seeing it? Well, their broker is supposed to forward it to them. And I said, have you ever worked for a broker? <laughs> they get a thousand emails, like there, there's no way. Um, also someone commented, the broker has to cancel it. The agent cannot cancel it. That's true. Um, and a, only a broker can cancel a listing because they own the listing. I also can cancel it. Down here at our office, we can cancel it for the agent if they want us to. And um, I think I've answered now those questions. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, all right, and so sharing your login credentials, I think is where we were talking. You never ever wanna do that. Do not let anyone sign in as you ever. No agent should be doing that either. If any of you here are signing in as someone else, please don't do that. You need to have your own login credentials, but then you assume the identity of that person once you're in. Hopefully that's how you're all already operating. Any questions about that, we'll, we'll, we'll get to at the end if you want. I'm going to kind of breeze through some other topics now. Um, were there, that's, that's really essentially what I had in terms of compliance and the notices. Were there any questions about that section before I touch on the, the few other topics that I wanted to go over? I just want to clarify something. Um, the, the coming soon addendum, you said we attach in the listing under documents, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and another thing to note, uh, just since we're talking about document attachment, a lot of times agents will very helpfully attach their source of square footage to the listing and they think that that will prevent an audit. I love that. I love that they're attaching that information and that it's readily available there. But I want you guys to know just from an administrative standpoint, my system isn't smart enough to catch that there's already a document attached. If they're going to get a listing audit, they're going to get it. And, um, and if they come back and say, I attached that to the listing, then I'll go look and find what I need there and that's fine. 
but I won't know that it's there before I send it because I can't see it. As you guys know, as I'm, I'm going to switch back over, I live my life here. And so I see what listing data checker shows me a lot of the time. I have to literally go into Paragon and open those documents to see what's there. And I do a lot of times go back and forth, but just throwing that out there, if an agent ever seems upset that I didn't know they had a document attached, it's because I just didn't see it. Um, we, we make mistakes too. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's talk about data share. Does anybody have any burning questions about the data share we have started with um, Greater Alabama MLS? This is not a merger. I want to throw that out there. Again, with our, with our jargon issue, you hear agents talk about the merger with Birmingham. We 100% did not merge with Birmingham. They are their own identity, their own company. And like I explained before, Valley MLS is owned by HAR. We are an, an individual entity. Um, what we have done is what's called a data exchange. We created a database called the Alabama Exchange. We, we refer to him as Alex. Um, and now agents that are kind of working in both markets, they can have a listing in one that shows up in both. Some of our, our agents have literally been paying for membership in both because they wanted to list in both. And now some of those agents will be able to save a little money because their listings they put in Valley will show up in Greater Alabama and they don't have to pay for those dues just to make that happen. So that's pretty great. I mean, as with any um, integration of this kind of data over such a large scale, you can imagine we've had some hiccups. It is not going exactly as we hoped it would go, um, but it's been pretty smooth. It's been okay. Um, one of the things that we, um, sorry, one of the things that we added on the agent full report is an originating system so that you know which list, which system am I even looking at. Um, I'm going to hop back over to Paragon and we're going to look at our example listing here. And right here underneath the school information and the price per square foot, you see originating system Valley MLS. That means that came from, from our system. If it says originating system GAL MLS, that's Greater Alabama and it's pulling from their system, which means it's going to be um, an agent who is not most likely a member of, of our association. But um, you can also search this if you go to your search screen, which let me see, I think you should be able to see if I do, if I do a residential search. And again, these are only residential listings, land, commercial, these are not pulling yet. We are only sharing residential. If we go down here to the very bottom of the search, you can see those have been added originating system. And so I can say in here, in my search, I just want to see Valley listings. You can do that if you want to. So that is uh, an option there. We do have a, a frequently asked questions sheet that went out and is available on the har.realtor site. Uh, it's one of the things I'll send to you at the end of this class. The data share um, frequently asked questions as well as um, the resource sheet that I have for you. And I also created uh, a, a simple guide for attaching our association in dot loop. For those of you that are helping your agents do that, it'll be something you can easily forward to them so they can just do it themselves. <clears throat> While we're looking at the search, I want to draw your attention to, for me, what's about the fifth or sixth line down. My search might look different than yours because as you know or may not know, these are very customizable. When you go up under this little gear here, customize, not only can I add and remove the fields that I want to use, but I can literally move them. I can drag my close date to be down below my status date if I want to. And then once I change that, it will literally change the order. Oh, I got a conflict, but I don't really need to save it, but you'll see that it literally flipped them. Um, so you can move your, um, your lines up and down. I keep talking with my hands like everybody can see what I'm looking at. Um, so the listing visibility type. You can see there are three listing visibility types in there now. Um, as of two days ago, there would have only been one and it would have been MLS listings. The problem is when you search, it wasn't showing you coming soons or new constructions, at least not proposed or under constructions. 
because both all, all of those types are in a special class that don't count days on market. And when you're not counting days on market, this is the best way Paragon came up with to do that was to put them in their own listing visibility type. So a lot of times I'll get a call from an agent who's saying, I'm trying to save a search for my clients. When I do the search, I'm seeing 42 listings, but then it forces me to choose a visibility type and I choose all MLS listings. And it goes from 42 to 36. Why did those other six listings disappear? Well, they disappeared because even though MLS listings sounds like it should be everything, it's really everything that isn't in a different class. Excuse me, not class, visibility type. So you have to tell it, I want to see all MLS listings and new construction, no DOM, and coming soon, no DOM, if you want to see those. So we've now changed the default search to default to these three in an attempt to get these seen because we understand that's a blind spot. But we need your guys' help with this. And I know it's a little confusing and hard to understand, so please ask questions. But if your agents are using a saved search, which most of them probably are now, they're probably already have their own search in there saved and they're not coming back to our default, they will need to add these listing visibility types either to their saved search if they want to or anytime they wish to see them. I'm bringing this up because it's become an issue lately on two fronts. We have the, the agents, like I just explained, who are looking for buyers, but they can't see those new construction listings and they're frustrated because they know they're there, but they're not coming up in the search. Listing visibility type is the answer. On the other side of that, I have new construction builders who have figured out that buyer's agents can't see them. So what are they doing? Well, they're doing their best to be seen and they had somehow figured out, well, if I don't say I'm under construction in my age on the home, if I say that it's new construction, it's new, never occupied, which means it's a finished house, then suddenly people can see it. So I have builders who are unknowingly manipulating the system because you know, they, they don't realize that's a problem. They just wanna be seen. But then let's say you have a buyer who's looking for a house that's ready to go. They're not looking for a house that, that will be ready in six months. They're gonna get frustrated when half of their listings in their search are listings that they cannot move into because they're not actually new, never occupied. They're still under construction. So I'm trying right now to get all the builders to get in line with putting real, if it's not built yet, it can't be new, never occupied, but we're also trying to educate the buyer's agents to be able to find you in the right place. So it's kind of a twofold problem. Listing visibility type. When you hear those words and you can't remember what you were supposed to remember about that, call me and I'll explain it to you. Um, <clears throat> another thing, um, I bet a lot of you are probably marking solds for your agents um, or your brokers. When, when a listing comes back, a closing comes in, you're going into the system and marking it as sold. If you're not, I would like to make a humble suggestion that your office consider a policy of not paying an agent out until it is closed. Because I don't have any real way of holding them accountable to that because I don't know that it closed if their past projected closing day didn't close. And I have listings that I am still working with brokers to get closed from 2019. So um, it's just, it's, it can be a little frustrating. So if we can get ahead of that, that would be awesome. And just really get these marked. If you find one that's two months old and you think, oh man, I'm gonna have to fall on my sword here and, and get Teddy to close this because I can't, because it's been too far. Number one, that's fine. We, don't, we do not um, find people for self-reporting. Um, also, you can close it out just like you normally would. It will not let you use the proper close date once you've gone more than five days past, but you can use the current date and then send an email to MLS support at valleymls.com, which you'll get on your resource sheet that I'm going to send you. Um, you can send that. It goes to everybody in our department and whoever sees it will update that listing to the correct closing date for you. So you can just close it out like normal with the wrong date and we'll fix the date, if that makes sense. Um, when you are marking them also, uh, and you go to put in the selling agent, as we all know, the selling agent really represented the buyer that does trip people up. A lot of times that's a mistake that gets made. I get calls from listing agents all the time. Oh God, I accidentally put myself in. No problem. We'll fix it. 
But here's something that's going to be harder to fix. And again, I need your guys' help with this. Get the word out, please. When you go to put in an agent's name, let's say I put in Rebecca Smith. I don't even know if that's an agent, but let's say I type in Rebecca Smith. And you know it wants to auto populate and give you an option. This Rebecca Smith at Keller Williams. Well, now it might say, or this Rebecca Smith at Keller Williams. You're going to see two of them in some cases because some of our agents are members of both our MLS and Greater Alabama. Now with the data share, they are showing up in both. So here's how you know which one is which. When you have your little field where you would type Rebecca Smith, instead of typing Rebecca Smith, go to the end of that field where there's the little magnifying glass and click on that. It'll bring up a list of agents and there you can type Rebecca Smith and it'll show you both Rebecca Smiths, but now it's gonna show you one is a realtor and one is a data share participant. The data share participant is her identity in Greater Alabama MLS. And if I credit that person with the sale, Rebecca Smith will not get credit for the sale. Rebecca Smith, the realtor from Valley MLS is the one you wanna choose. The other issue here is if they are a non-Valley MLS member, but they are a member of Greater Alabama MLS, you still don't wanna choose their name. You would just wanna put in that series of six number ones, 111111 is a non-Valley MLS member. That's how you close out with somebody on the other side who is not one of us, so to speak. So um, any questions on closing out listings? Okay, let's talk about putting in listings. Um, listing input is a, a bear, I know, and um, any suggestions that you all have for making that easier, my ears are open. Please know that next year, is that's something we're looking at is listing input, and um, we want to know, you know, what you're seeing. What issues are you finding? Send me screenshots, you know, by all means, what, whatever, you know, is meaningful. Um, again, we want to try to make it better and fix it. One of the things you might see change next year, if we can get it implemented, is all listings may have to start with a tax autofill. Um, that would probably, you know, obviously we would have to make some exception for new constructions. Um, but one of the things we love about our new tax software, CRS tax, in case you haven't used it, is wonderful, um, is if you autofill that parcel number, it's going to bring it over in the correct format. There's no more of this, oh, do I start Madison County with 089 or was that 087? Um, you don't have to remember any of that. Um, the system will literally just pull it right over for you. So I would suggest you start doing that now. Even if the parcel number is the only piece of information you want to autofill, that's very helpful. But it's also helpful to get some of that other stuff pulled over if you can, and then just correct what needs to be corrected. So um, CRS tax, uh, I'm going to actually, since we're still sharing screen and I completely forgot we were, um, I am going to actually go into CRS tax. Let me show you where that is. So when you're looking at the top of your Paragon homepage, and we have all these wonderful buttons here, um, under the tax button, uh, most of our people are jumping right over into, excuse me, uh, right over into those counties over on the right, because that's what they're used to using. And I think it's because the Paragon tax info we had here, people didn't like it, and they're just used to jumping over it. But Madison County recently changed their tax website, and that has confused some of our agents. And though I will say, I actually think their map is really great if you fiddle with it a little bit. Um, our information is right here, CRS data tax search. When we go into CRS data, you can put it up to four counties. Uh, mine defaults to Madison. You can have yours default to whatever you like. And then you can start typing in information here um, and you will get you know, a, a list of different properties. You can start with an address, you can start with a parcel number, a name, just like you can any other tax site. You'll see that it opens up here. It's going to show me the map with the parcel. And if I scroll down, it's going to give me all of the tax information that the Madison County website would have given me. And it's also going to give me MLS sales history. I've got a mortgage history here, property characteristics. There's a lot of information here available in CRS tax data. It's a really great system. Um, another place that we can actually utilize that, if I can get back over to my market monitor, is when you're looking at a spreadsheet view, you will notice all these weird buttons that look almost identical. It's kind of annoying that they look so similar, but if you hover over them, they will tell you what they are. And the first one 
is CRS data property report, which will take us exactly into that same report, except apparently I have let my session expire. Um, it would take us exactly into that same report that uh, we just looked at for, um, for that other random listing. Let me go back in. It signs us out too, isn't that fun? Um, let's go to market monitor again and see if we can make this work. I don't like it when things don't work right. Although I used to teach preschool and I would tell people all the time that that was just science. Sometimes things just doesn't work. Some things, eh, sometimes things don't work the way you think. All right, now I'm gonna click on that uh, report button and you can see, look at all this wonderful information that's available to me just at, a click, at the click of that button. And I can hop right back over into my spreadsheet view. I didn't have to leave. I didn't have to change anything I was looking at. I can just say, I wonder how many acres this property is, or I wonder who owns that. You know, I mean, there's just so much information available here. It's great. And I'll be really honest, CRS tax data, if, when you see those education opportunities pop up in the coming year, please take advantage of those because your agents will love this program if they look. Every agent I have shown this has been like, wow, wow because it does prospecting. Um, it, it really, it's just a very complete um, program that I think they're really gonna wanna take advantage of. So CRS tax data, um, that's a, a great resource. Please take advantage of it. And that brings me um, kind of to what I wanted to talk about was those resources. We're kind of getting to the end here. Um, we have an events calendar that is um, available on your uh, dashboard. If we go back to the dashboard, and we come over here on the right-hand side, the calendar of events. We can click that. And it's gonna bring us into the calendar. You can see everything blue is education. And it looks like January, we already have that Paragon Basics and Collab Center, Home Snap, Professional Standards and RPR all ready to go uh, for January. Um, you can actually um, get in here and add stuff to your own calendar. You can ask for an email reminder about these things. This is a great place to look for your own training. Um, any of these um, 10 o'clock Zoom sessions are probably going to be open to you. Those are free one hour, one and a half hour classes like this one. Um, and a lot of these things, even if they're not interesting to you, would be interesting to your agents. So this is a great place to look. Um, let's see. Oh, yep, MLS tips and tricks. We talked about that. That's a great one. Um, learning about key features in HomeSnap is cool. I sat through a HomeSnap class and I didn't know this, you guys, but if an agent is going into a listing on HomeSnap, they can click something called the safety timer and have that set up so that if they don't come back and click it within a certain amount of time and say, yes, I'm fine, that their alert person will get an, a message saying, please check on this person because you know, their, their timer ran out. So if they're going into a house and they're not sure what situation they're walking into, I mean, I know sometimes we, we recommend, you know, taking someone with you or, or whatever, but that, that home snap safety timer is kind of a cool feature to have too. So I didn't even know that existed until I sat through the class. So um, that's a cool thing. I have to sit through another collab center class myself. You might see me there on January 8th because people call me about that. And I'm like, blind spot. I don't know. I'm so sorry. Um, so that one I'm working on. So we want to encourage everyone to take advantage of these resources, take advantage of these classes. Um, one of the things I'm going to send to you is um, with this list is basically a list of the stuff we offer. We like to kind of brag about how much value we bring, right? Um, like the dot loop accounts that people have, those premier accounts, that's part of their membership. Showing time. Um, Home Snap. Everybody is loving Home Snap. I don't know how if you guys are hearing that too, but Home Snap has been a wonderful addition. Um, we now have Paragon Connect, which has replaced Paragon Mobile, and I've heard is much better and more user friendly than what we had before. But I don't know that anyone's going to use it because they love Home Snap so much. Uh, we talked about the CRS tax data. Uh, what else do we have? Cloud CMA, Colab Center. We have market stats available on the dashboard. Let me show you this. Every person I show this, and again, if, if it's you're signing in as an admin, you may not have this, but your broker definitely has this and probably doesn't know it. If you click on market stats right here, it is going to, let me just close that. Got stuff everywhere. 
Um, it brings us into this really, you know, kind of boring looking chart, but I wanted you to know that everything in here is customizable. Right now I'm looking at the entire MLS and I'm looking at median sales price. Well, maybe I don't want median sales price. Maybe what I want to know is how many homes are for sale. Wow, look at that. The number of homes for sale from 2017 down to 2020. Wow. That's just, you know, the entire MLS. Maybe I want to come up here and say, no, I want to look at only uh, the county of Colbert. Look at that. Looks a lot different in Colbert County than it does for the entire MLS. Um, I can also change my price range, my property type, the number of bedrooms I'm looking at, the square footage. It goes on and on how um, customized this can be. I can look at years and months. Um, I can look at a line chart or at a bar graph if, I, if that's more meaningful to the data that I'm looking at. Um, again, we can just switch days on market now. It's the bar graph for days on market. Man, it's really gone up in, in that county, right? But if we looked at the entire MLS, let's go with entire MLS, completely different story in one county versus the entire MLS. So you can really customize your stats here and get um, some really cool data to share with your people if you wanna use this. So this is again, just a resource that we offer. Um, also on this, uh, you will see down under quick links, there is RPR. That is a product from NAR. That's not actually from us. That's a National Association of Realtor Product. Um, you, your agent will sign into that using their NERDS number. And um, this is a collaboration between 600 MLSs around the country, including Valley and Greater Alabama and many others. If you are looking for information out of market, be it curiosity or to help someone, um, RPR is a cool resource. They are pulling not only um, from MLSs, they're also pulling tax data and mortgage data um, and trying to give you as much about that property as they can. So that's a cool resource I didn't know about either until very recently. Um, and of course, we talked about the data share, that information exchange that we're doing. That's another resource that we're bringing um, for you all. And then just these educational opportunities, the CE. I can't remember how many hours of CE that Mike did, but all the free uh, continuing education classes he did, I think they said they figured the math up that he saved our agents um, $77,000 collectively um, in the free CE that we got to offer this year. So, um, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, we're, we're just kind of bragging there that we have all these great resources because we, you know, we really do try. This is, this is what drives us. We want to support the members. We want to support you. So please tell me in your role as support staff, if you see things we can help to support you, whether you're licensed or unlicensed, um, or to support your agents, we want to hear about that. Um, and if you have any questions now that you haven't asked about licensed versus unlicensed assistance or um, anything about assuming IDs, searching, Paragon, anything like that, or anything we've talked about or haven't, go ahead, now would be a great time. All right, well, I guess we got our questions answered and we have come right up against the end of our window here. I see some stuff in chat. Let me take a look and see what popped out. Let's see, subdivision CNRs would be super helpful in that report. I'm sorry, I moved on too far and I don't know what report we're talking about. If you would, I'm typing in chat, tax data report, subdivision CNRs would be super helpful in that report. Okay, the subdivision on the, are we talking about the CRS tax report? We would like to see the subdivision. I would be surprised if it isn't here, but yeah, location. We've got subdivision right here under location. If that's, let me get back in chat. Feel free to unmute yourself uh, if you can, because it could be a little easier. I am confused because I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what CNRs are. <laughs> Again, with my... I think she means covenants and restrictions. Oh, 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 okay. Um, yes, covenants and restrictions. Thank you. That is what that means. Um, I'm not sure where we could get that added. Those mm, covenants and restrictions are tough. I'll tell you what, guys, if I could change anything about the way 
real estate operates in Alabama, it would be the HOAs. Um, it is like a wild west trying to get that information and keep it up to date. Uh, yes, I would be happy to jump back into CRS in just a second. And I know it'll be very basic, but there will be, there have been and will continue to be trainings on CSR, CRS, tax data. But I'll hop over there in just a moment. I want to make sure I get all these questions. Can admins get HomeSnap? Um, I don't think so. I don't think that you are able to actually have HomeSnap as, as, um, as an admin, but that is a great question. And I will ask that. Admin HomeSnap. Um, I know there were some things we've tried to do that don't work for you all the way we thought they would, even the way you signed up for this class is different than the way everyone else signs up for classes because admin were finding that they couldn't do it the right way because of the way you all are structured with your emails. Some of you share email addresses and things like that, at least in our system. So, um, I'm not sure, but I'm going to find out for you. That's a good question. Um, and yes, let's go back to CRS tax. So I close my chat and move this guy over. Nope, oh, I'm zooming in on the map. So if we just go back to our um, property search, this is kind of the main page that you'll land on when you go to CRS tax data. And um, this is where you put your counties right here. You can enter up to, up to four um, that you wanna look at at the same time in case you have, maybe you're looking for an owner and he has property in three different counties. Suddenly now you can look for them all in the same place. Isn't that wonderful? Um, but you know, for me, I'm gonna search Madison County and you can type here, you see a name, address, subdivision, parcel number, or an MLS number. I'm just kind of choosing a, an old house number of mine and then I'm choosing a house that isn't mine. So you won't see all of that, but I chose just randomly this one, but you can see it's trying to give me a lot of information. Maybe the one that I am looking for isn't here. So I can hit view more and I can see what else there might be to look at. Okay, I wanna look at this one. So then I click on that one, it's gonna bring me into the map, but also to this, all of this information here. That might be as far as you ever need to go with it. But up across the top, you're also gonna see that you have the option to make comparables, custom comparables. There's this prospecting right here, which is again, I'm not an agent and I don't really even know how to use that, but I know the agents that see it get really excited about it. So um, these are cool tools here. You can switch over into prospecting um, up at the top as well. And you can see you get kind of a completely different map view because you can kind of choose an area that you'd like to prospect. Some of these things will not be selectable until you get close enough, until you zoom in on the map to make them selectable, just so you know. Anytime I want help, I can hit help and that help is gonna be specific to the page that I'm on which is really great. You can see it opened up a new tab. It didn't take me away from that page. It simply opened up a new tab and it's giving me help with tutorial, video tutorials specific to the page I'm on. How cool is that? So um, that, you know, is, is honestly about as much as I know about CRS tax data because I don't use it like an agent would, but um, I've sat through a couple of trainings and I've just, I've heard them get excited about these prospecting tools about um, all the information and being available in one place. Um, and I want you to know that all of this is pulled through from every county in the state of Alabama. If you're ever curious about how old it is, data currency down here will tell me how long it has it been since this county sent me information. Well, Otago County, it's been since October of 2019. So if you're looking for Otago County, they just haven't sent us data in the past year. But you will come down to, for instance, Madison County, and you will notice that they have sent us data as recently as November 6th. So that's pretty recent data. Um, so that's just another fun thing to be able to find. You know, if, why can't I find this? Oh, it's because they, you know, this happened later than that, and they haven't sent the report since then, or whatever. Back on this sheet, there are actually just um, a few other options. That takes you into the property report. The first one, that's what we did. You can go straight into a comps report. If that's what you're looking for is comps. Um, it's gonna bring that up. Oh, I am zooming out on the map. But you can see it gave us a map here. Let's go back in. Showing us the comps that it pulled. 
Um, you can adjust these and change the parameters. You can exclude things you don't want to show your age, your client. And then you can just email this right from here, right to your client. There's your comps, boom. Um, so that's another, you know, cool thing it does that a lot of people aren't even, you know, realizing yet. Demographics report. I don't know how important that is, but it's there. And then um, just a map of the property. Again, uh, super easy to find. There's a report it button here as well. You can hit um, if you know here that we need to report something. So that's about as far as I can take you with CRS tax data, but I would definitely encourage you to look for those. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in January, some are going to pop up that we're going to see some classes on that. Oh, uh, CRS from Paragon or from the dashboard. Okay. Yes, it is from Paragon. So here we're going straight to the report. And once you're there, you can navigate. I keep just opening new windows. You can um, navigate inside of CRS tax data any way you like. But if you're just trying to get to the generic site, you come up to tax. And you'll see there's that autofill we talked about if you want to use that. But if you actually just want to get to the site, it's right here. CRS data tax search. That's, that's where we went. So um, we have gotten to the end of everything I had. So I'm just going to keep answering questions as long as there are questions. And if you all are done, by all means, um, have a great day. Thanks for coming. Please look for an email from me uh, that will include a resource sheet, including my email address, um, all of our email addresses. Uh, it's going to have that dot loop adding association uh, form as well as the frequently asked questions for data share. I encourage you all to get signed up with Sean again uh, for those um, emails. And if you've put something in here in chat that you wanted me to add you um, in the um, to those compliance emails, please know that I will need you to send me an email about that because this is going to disappear when I close this. So um, just send an email. Uh, you're going to get one from me that you can just reply to or my email um, was in chat, but let me type it one more time just for those who might want it. And then this is an email address for you to remember as well. This email address, oh, I mistyped it. That's not going to help you. MLS support at valleymls.com. That's going to come to me, Rhonda, and Melissa. That way, if you need something changed, it's not just going to sit in my inbox while I'm on a sick day. You know, it's going to go to all of us where somebody will get to it. So MLS support at valleymls.com. We're here for you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to get information in your hands. I hope that you, I really think that you're excited to get it too. And that's why so many of you are here. Um, so thanks a lot. Thanks for your help. And again, I'm your girl at the MLS. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. Thank you, Teddy Lou. Thanks. Oh, good Thank to you, see Teddy. You. Bye, everybody. Bye.